Lots of attention on this one, uh, especially this year and next year in the run up to the 2020 and 2021 uh, target setting deadlines. And also some commentators even believe this could be more of a challenge to the automotive industry than even uh, the current coronavirus crisis. Hello and welcome to a new Automotive View video. Today's subject is the European CO2 Compliance Challenge, specifically the EU Corporate Fleet CO2 Targets. Lots of attention on this one, uh, especially this year and next year in the run up to the 2020 and 2021 uh, target setting deadlines. And also some commentators even believe this could be more of a challenge to the automotive industry than even uh, the current coronavirus crisis. So let's unpack some of the details. Uh, so if we remember back, 2015 target was 130 grams per kilometer of CO2, uh, and that uh, and the industry enabled um, for 2019, 122.4 grams per kilometer. So that was the average for the industry achieved last year, uh, still an estimate at this point in time, but the uh, real number should be pretty close to, to that figure. And if we remember the target for 2021 is now 95 grams per kilometer or 4.1 liters uh, per 100 kilometers driven. Uh, and, and again, some complexity there as the testing cycle has changed uh, or is changing. Uh, so the 95 grams was on the old NEDC, the new European driving cycle. And from 2021, uh, we're testing on the WLTP, so the World Harmonized Light Vehicle Test Procedure. And the idea really is uh, it's designed to be closer to real world driving emissions and fuel consumption standards. So let's think about 2021. So 95 grams under uh, NEDC, convert that to WLTP, that gets us to about 114 grams per kilometer. And the important thing about next year is that that is the benchmark target for future um, deadlines, future uh, consumption deadlines. So for example, by 2025, the industry has to achieve a roughly a 15% improvement on the 2021 number. So that takes us to an average of about 97 grams or so on WLTP. And then by 2030, the in industry has to achieve a 37.5% improvement on 2021 number. And that takes us to about 71 grams per kilometer or 3.1 liters per 100 kilometers. But right now, the European uh, Commission are, are in a consultation phase, so they're actually looking at much, much harsher or more difficult um, CO2 uh, compliance targets for the future as part of the, um, the, the, the climate change agenda. So, you know, greening, uh, the, greening the economy more significantly than even the, um, the already set standards. So by 2020, uh, sorry, 2030, we could see uh, a harder target of almost 55% uh, reduction, and that would take us to about 51 grams per kilometer, or translating to consumption figures, that's 2.2 liters per 100 kilometer, or in uh, old fashioned US MPG, that's about 107 uh, MPG. So, very hard targets for the industry. Not all OEMs or car makers have the same targets. Um, so the 95 gram isn't for everybody, it's an average for the industry and the OEMs themselves have different targets uh, based on their performance uh, at the end of 2021. And the idea here is there's a weight based uh, part of the calculation, the limit value curve, uh, and the idea behind the design of that was to, so that not all OEMs are overly penalized, um, especially makers of, of, of heavier cars or more premium cars or cars with uh, more advanced technology and things like that. The other issue is um, on credits. Uh, so there are credits available to get you towards those CO2 targets. So low emission vehicles effectively count uh, twice. So they double up their, their impact on, on the CO2 averages. And also there's some eco innovations as well. So uh, you know, to, to trying to get um, low emission technology into vehicles, uh, there's, a, there's a bonus for those, a credit, things like LED lamps uh, and other um, fuel saving endeavors. The other thing the, uh, the car makers or, or OEMs can do is, is pull together. So the pooling is available. They can team up um, with uh, um, brands within their, their own company or even with rival brands and, and, and companies uh, in order to um, pool their, their average CO2 emissions across, across uh, the European market. A good example there is FCA um, and, and Tesla have teamed up. And obviously Tesla getting paid in that example uh, for its, for its uh, contribution of its of zero free credits. 
Just a word on the geography of the of the, um, the arrangement. So at the moment for 2020, it's EU, UK, uh, Norway and Ireland. So UK is still in the system um, because of the transition year to Brexit. But from 2021, the UK will exit and they'll come up with their own system, probably very, very similar uh, to the European Union one. But for, in terms of the calculation, the UK figures will, will from next year be excluded um, from the European fleet average calculations. Quick word on fines. So car makers who exceed the targets face fines from the European Union. Uh, an example here, so if, if you're selling a million or so new cars in Europe um, and you miss the deadline by about five grams, you then pay 95 euro per vehicle um, for each gram over. And so in that example, it would be a million units of vehicles times five grams of CO2 uh, multiplied by uh, 95 euro fine. And that gets you roughly around 500 million uh, euro or so penalty, and, and that's just for that one year of non-compliance. So the stakes are high uh, for the European automotive industry. Okay, so now we know what the targets are. Uh, next up, how will the car makers adjust uh, their strategies to deal with them? Uh, so especially important here are the, are the model mix or the segment coverage that each OEM provides, and also the propulsion mix, so the blend of different propulsion technologies uh, they'll use in order to achieve that um, target. In particular, you know, what happens to ICE vehicles, internal combustion engine vehicles, uh, and, and what happens in terms of bringing in uh, EVs, especially plug-in hybrid electric vehicles, so-called PHEVs, and also BEVs, so-called um, battery electric vehicles. So it might be helpful to visualize this uh, for maybe a, a sort of a simple theoretical portfolio lineup of a particular manufacturer. Uh, so a sort of matrix, if you like. So we can see that A, B, C, these are size segments from A, the city cars, all the way up to larger uh, e, e segments, sedans and, and SUVs. And then also you can see there the body type as well. So what, what type of vehicle is it uh, and what target, uh, what customer is it, is, it, uh, is it designed to fulfill? So for 2015, sort of simpler times, if you like, um, you know, OEMs had a good deal of segment coverage, but, you know, more often than not, one or two vehicles in each segment was enough to, to, to satisfy the market. Play it forward, you know, 2019, we're starting to see some of the new vehicles arrive. Um, so EVs in particular, especially plug-ins and battery electric vehicles, are really you know, designed to help them achieve compliance for the target years of 2020 uh, and 2019. And we also start to see some exits, so especially high CO2 models, um, especially you know, around sports and speciality type vehicles, in order to you know, fine tune that number uh, ready for the end of 2021. By 2023, lots more electrified vehicles across many more segments. You know, someone like BMW might call this uh, the power of choice uh, for consumers effectively. But really, it's becoming more and more difficult for OEMs uh, to manage uh, with so much complexity in their, in their um, supply chain and in their model mix matrix. Uh, so, you know, you start to see double offer, even triple offer in some segment uh, combinations and clearly hard for the OEMs to keep this uh, going for, for multiple years into the future. So by 2030, we can see, you know, the CO2 pressures obviously intensifying, as we discussed earlier, uh, we're starting to see, um, you know, various restrictions on ICE vehicles, even, you know, talk of them being banned altogether or, or restricted, you know, very, very heavily. Uh, and clearly, you know, we're starting to see ICE vehicles begin to phase out there and be replaced entirely by electrified vehicles, increasingly towards battery electrified vehicles. So complexity is clearly an issue um, and also it's useful to look at um, how the OEMs will cope with this. So what routes to compliance uh, is available to them? And, you know, worth saying there's more than one way to skin a cat. So just like, you know, that old phrase, um, there's more than one way that the OEMs can, can achieve this. So we just brought you know, highlighted a few here uh, to, for consideration. So one is minimum compliance. So, you know, they just really do the bare minimum to scrape through the various stages of compliance. Um, they might need to adjust their strategy towards pooling. So if they can't do it themselves, they'll be relying on, on partners or even sometimes rivals uh, to help um, to get them there. And obviously that they might need to pay for that in some circumstances. Another strategy might be slow and steady. Um, so they'll, you know, fairly gentle glide path towards compliance with a mix of electrified variants and possibly BEV standalones. So in this respect, similar to the first one, really, you know, manufacturers are seeking to keep the ICE for as long as possible, but obviously, you know, realistic um, to the requirement for adding electrified vehicles as they go through uh, time. 
Other OEMs might decide to go fast. So in this one, you know, EV rollout across the range, as we saw from those segment charts, um, and especially battery electric vehicles from 2024. And some of the OEMs pursuing this sort of strategy um, might plan to monetize this go fast by pooling with other OEMs and actually you know, generating a cash in income um, from doing that. So another source of revenue, if you like. Another one might be a forced European Union exit. Uh, so maybe the European Union doesn't really fit with the, the global strategic plans of particular car makers in the, in the future. And it could be that any, any exits we see um, and this strategy will be um, you know, timed around those very important uh, CO2 compliance deadlines. So 2021, we might start to see some exits. 2025, we'd probably expect uh, a few more. And 2030, obviously, uh, is, 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 the, is the big one in terms of um, scoring compliance into the future. And then on the flip side of this, you know, OEMs might decide to enter the European Union. So rising European uh, acceptance, if you like, of electric vehicle vehicles or support uh, for, for those very, by various uh, carrot and stick arrangements could actually um, bring OEMs into the European market. You know, we've seen Tesla, you know, join um, and, and obviously start to build vehicles here pretty soon. Uh, and we might see some others. And some of these could, could well be sort of joint ventures of convenience between European car makers and, um, and car makers with, you know, prowess in, in battery electric technology. Uh, so we've seen a few of these crop up in recent years, um, with, with, with especially with some Chinese OEMs. So clearly a lot to play for. Next up, we'll consider some of the challenges uh, the car makers might face as they roll out electrified vehicles in Europe. Um, so in no particular order. Driving range, clearly a classic one. Uh, range anxiety could be a, a bit of a deal breaker for some people. So obviously lots to do in terms of educating consumers and obviously uh, managing the rollout of battery capacity and, and all the and charging, um, onboard charging uh, provision and all the rest of it. Uh, cell supply chain. So what we're talking about here is the battery cells themselves. You know, there's not very many European um, battery supply right now. There's lots of projects in the offing and all the rest of it. Um, the responsible sourcing of raw materials comes into this. Uh, and clearly, you know, there's a big supply chain risk inherent in, um, in, in battery supply um, in the coming years. Uh, research and design life cycle. Um, so which technologies to adopt? How fast will the uh, technology curve be? Um, you know, think back to iPhone versus Nokia. Are we going to see some of those um, things happening in, in Europe, for example? Tesla versus everyone. You know, we've had 130 years of, of ICE type vehicles uh, and only 10 years of Tesla. Um, so what's going to happen in the future in terms of investment and investment payback? You know, very important area. ESG focus, so doing the right thing, environmental, social and corporate governance is obviously a big topic these days. And so, you know, increasingly ESG based um, focus from, from investors or scrutiny from investors in particular and sustainability and societal impacts are clearly very, very important across all corporates, um, but especially in automotive. Uh, regulation incentives, so clearly carrot and stick here from the, the, the regulators and the legislators in this one. So, you know, how will those evolve? Uh, we've already heard about, you know, news stories about ICE bans, even very serious, serious restrictions in some countries. Um, but how will this work in practice and what tensions will emerge between consumers and voters uh, against legislators uh, and regulators, you know, essentially governments of Europe? So this needs a, a good deal of certainty uh, in consumers' mind, because uh, obviously wild changes can really, really distort uh, demand, even, even on a very short term basis. The charging network itself, so more of a chicken and egg, I guess, this one here, you know, clean energy is a big issue here. You know, lots of countries in Europe are certainly going to struggle in the provision of clean energy in the time frame we're looking to. And, and obviously, from a consumer acceptance point of view, you know, we need ease of use, easy payment across different charging uh, networks. And also, you know, the time and convenience of charging is clearly an issue for many versus the, the, the relative ease of, of refueling uh, with current liquid fuel. Price cost and TCO, so TCO is uh, uh, total cost of ownership in this one. So this is really could become the number one issue. If we can achieve some degree of TCO or price parity, and in certainly in terms of list price in the coming years. So clearly this could aid the uptake of electrification and certainly smooth the path of consumers into electrified vehicles. 
And then fuel price, obviously a big component of TCO in particular. And one of the big concerns from governments around Europe is, you know, how do you replace the, the taxation revenue, the income from, from taxation of fuel uh, is obviously a big challenge in the coming, in the coming years. So almost time to wrap things up. Clearly the scale of the compliance challenge is immense. Uh, and many commentators look into the fact that, you know, the next five or 10 years could see more change to the industry than the previous 50 to 100 years. So clearly uh, lots to play for. 